Hey everyone and welcome back to another video, thanks for tuning in. A couple of years back now I bought a couple of Commodore 5.5 inch floppy disk drives for my Commodore pets. Around this time I just finished repairing that uh, blue Commodore pet you can see at the back there, the 2001 model, which is quite badly damaged. And then I uh, got the uh, bug and bought a couple more. Uh, a 4016 you can see on the right there, which I'm still working on, and also a 3016. I got the 8050 at quite a good price and included the rare cable um, that this needs to connect to the Commodore PET. Just paid uh, £70 for that one, but the other one there, the 340 on the left, I paid about 185 for that total with their uh, postage, and that also came with a cable, but it had an adapter with it. This adapter converts the uh, standard IEEE-4AA cable into the right connection that the Commodore PET needs, the card slot on the back. The cable alone can actually go for as much as the disk drive itself uh, because for some reason they seem to be quite rare, I'm not quite sure why. When I got both of these drives they were actually flashing the LED lights on the front um, which I later found out is actually a uh, fault code uh, for these. These different light sequences indicate different faults which can be matched up in the service manual. I did connect these drives to the computer at the time. Um, I think all I was getting was some machine code up on the screen on one of them. And uh, since uh, plugging them back in again two years later, all I'm getting now is a steady illumination on all three LEDs on both machines. Both these drives have the dreaded reefer cap at the back, uh, just near the transformer. Um, they haven't blown yet, but I'm sure they will soon if they haven't already been replaced. These reefer caps can sometimes be actually inside the kettle type uh, socket on the back when the AC core plugs in. But on my two examples here, thankfully, it's a cable directly into the back, so there is no socket. So that means the reefer cap will be on its own. So I've got two drives here, both with problems. So it looks like the same problems uh, going by those uh, faulty uh, LED indicators on the front there, uh, not flashing at all. So today I'm going to be looking at the 8050. I'm going to concentrate on that one. Um, I have actually already got this working, I'm uh, pleased to say. And I'm going to be showing exactly what I did uh, in the form of a documentary, I guess, uh, for myself and for anybody else out there who has any problems with one of these drives. So let's have a quick look at the specs of this 8050 drive. Um, looking here online I found some information about it, in fact they're all here. Uh, this one is a single sided quad density format disk drive at 512k per disk side. Um, interestingly they did another model, the 8250 LP, that's a double sided quad density format, 1 megabyte per disk, which was uh, quite a lot back then. Both these drives use the IEEE 4AA interface bus. This was developed by Hewitt Packard in the late 1960s and was used in other devices in the 70s and early 80s. It's a short range digital communications 8 bit parallel multi master interface bus. They actually did a 8 inch floppy disk drive as well, which looks absolutely amazing. I have no idea if this drive is actually available in Europe and here in England, but if it was, I would love to own one one day. Uh, we do actually have some disks here. When you look at uh, how big a 5.5 inch disk is, you think that's large compared to a standard three and a half inch floppy disk which came out shortly after these. The eight inch ones are absolutely humongous. Hopefully one day I'll own an eight inch drive so I can have a look at all my discs to see what's on them. One of the interesting facts about these Commodore floppy disk drives is that essentially they are actually a standalone computer in themselves. All that's missing is a display and a keyboard for input. And this is pretty much what the Commodore PET does. You send the disk drive commands from the Commodore PET and then the disk drive carries that command out while the computer can be doing something else. This is made possible because the disk drives themselves have their own operating system. Let's have a look at the motherboard and uh, label up all the ICs and see what they do. The board actually has its own CPU, in fact it actually has two 6502 CPUs. And at the top right there, there are eight RAM sockets. I'm very lucky actually that this board has sockets on it already. And as you can see, there's two missing there because I've already started working on it at this point. And the EEPROM at the top there is a 2511-6701-8250LP um, LP, and apparently that's the same as a 9014-6701. And then down at the bottom there, there are two chips with a DOS 2.5 installed. And then you have the Riot DOS 2.5 Micropolis chip, which I think is the disk controller. And then a 6522 VIA chip. And then last but not least, a couple of RAM IO timers. And this is what I found out on Zimbers.net. Not to mention all the other logic that's on there. So as you can see, this board is quite busy and it's got a lot going on, which of course potentially means a lot can go wrong. 
Okay, now that we've had a look at the drive and all of its specifications and we know where everything's located, what did I actually do first? Well, after the experience of working on the Commodore 4016 in my last video, if you haven't seen that, I found that some of the uh, cables for the power supply weren't uh, quite making contact and I wasn't getting the 5 volt rail going to the board itself. So I decided to get my infrared camera out and uh, look at some images with that. And as you can see there in those pictures, you can see that everything seems to be powered up okay. Saying that though, I still unplugged all the cables and plugged them back in again, just to make sure they were making a good contact. And the next thing to check would be all the chips in sockets to make sure they have good contact. Uh, some of these uh, earlier pets and uh, other devices have those white sockets that are notorious for making bad contact. They only actually have one point of contact on the outer part of the leg, unlike the later sockets which also have a contact point on the inner leg. So then you have less chance of any bad connections on the pins. So I went round all of the sockets and I poured every single IC, cleaned the socket with some uh, contact cleaner and reinserted it. I tried turning it on again, but still there was no change. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that the left IO RAM timer, um, the socket itself, was slightly raised at the bottom on the right hand side. Unfortunately, I didn't take a picture of this. And when I pulled the chip back out again, the whole socket came up with it. And I noticed that one of the pins had broken off. And of course, I immediately thought, is this the problem? Would it be great if it was that simple? So I removed the rest of the pins, gave it a good clean up, no problems on the uh, traces at all, and popped in a new socket. But unfortunately, this still didn't cure the problem. So next I went around every single EEPROM and checked uh, continuity on every single pin uh, from front to back just to make sure and sure enough they were all okay. So I thought the next port of call would be the RAM itself. Um, there are eight uh, chips in this, obviously like I mentioned before there's two missing there because I was already working on it at this point. Um, and these two could fail quite uh, regularly. This uses the 2114 chips and uh, I thought to myself I've got some of these. My other Commodore PET uses the video RAM and I know they're okay because it's working. So I thought uh, I'll go through each one of these, swap them out, and uh, see if we could find a culprit. And sure enough, I went through them all, and four out of the eight was actually faulty. So that proved to be quite a successful test. And then I remembered I had two more and something else, and uh, I filled it all up, turned it on, and sure enough, all the lights flashed for a moment, showing that it was booting up, and I was left with just a steady centre light. At this point, I was quite excited, and uh, quickly got my um, Commodore PET together, put basic 4 in it because I know that works with disk commands and uh, started typing some commands in to see what this drive could do if anything. I had to quickly go online and find out some commands for this because I've never actually used one of these computers before with a disk drive. If you type in print space ds dollar sign you get the operating system version come up. In this instance on this machine it's version 2.5. Uh, according to the specifications we looked at before it should be 2.7. I suppose uh, with an EPROM change it's uh, easily upgradable. So if you type in di shift r d1 that will get your directory of what's on that disk. As you can see it's working here but uh, when I first tried it it actually didn't work and I did have to clean the heads first. I must say they were very dirty. I don't think this thing had been used for years. And then the little felt pad that pushes the uh, head closer to the disk fell off and I couldn't find it so I had to make a new one out of some felt. And then things were working again. When I tried disk zero on the right hand side there, I did a directory and unfortunately all I got was a horrible sort of grinding sound which didn't sound very good. So then I decided to investigate this further and I thought the head's going to need a clean anyway so I thought let's take this thing apart and have a look inside. And to be able to get to the heads on this side you have to remove that PCB that's on the top. Uh, on my example here there was only one nut on the top, one riser nut, so there should be probably be two. I think one's missing. I think someone's been in here before actually uh, because uh, two of the drive screws themselves that are holding it in from underneath are actually missing as well. Underneath the PCB there's a metal plate which I'm assuming is probably as a shield to reduce interference to the head. It looks like an old PCB actually that's still got its film attached. I checked the stepper motor and I can see that was moving nice and freely. Then I gave the uh, head a clean with some isopropyl alcohol. Uh, this one actually wasn't as dirty as the other one, surprisingly. Probably because this one's been covered with a PCB. When I had a look underneath, I could see that the uh, shaft of the actual motor itself was slightly corroded. Um, I think the belt was uh, skidding on it um, because it was a bit powdery. So I uh, turned the belt inside out, put it back on after cleaning the spindle, and uh, then it's working fine, I'm pleased to say. 
Um, but I did have to adjust the eject mechanism. Uh, it wasn't ejecting the disc correctly. It wasn't pushing it all the way out. I had to uh, slacken off those two nuts that are pictured. Above them are two nylon washers. The nuts were just slightly too tight. And I dropped a little bit of oil on that guide as well. And that freed it up. And I'm pleased to say that after turning that belt over and cleaning the heads, this drive seems to be working just right. Uh, I've actually um, formatted a disc in it, and I've also loaded this game here, and it seems to be working perfectly. So there you have it, I finally have a working Commodore 5.5 inch floppy disk drive, um, which I'm really pleased about. I absolutely love using this thing, I love how clunky it is, and how mechanical it all sounds and everything when you're using it. Uh, these kind of things absolutely fascinate me. In a future video I'll have to have a look at that 3040 drive and see if we can get that one working. Well I hope you enjoyed watching that with me and I hope somebody out there finds this useful. Like I said before it's just a documentary, this is not a how to video. Uh, this is just uh, me doing what I do and trying to get things working and keeping these old uh, relics going for future generations. Well I guess that just leaves me to say as always thanks for watching and until the next video I'll be seeing you. And if you did enjoy watching this video, you may want to take a look at some of my other videos on similar themes. I'm always buying something on eBay, some old piece of technology and trying to repair it. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Thanks for watching.